common question I get asked is, should I study the skull and how should I study it? So I recommend having a skull. I like having one to look at. I, I think the Proco skull is, is awesome. You can try doing it from invention, but again, I would say the, the reference I would recommend is that you have a skull. To look at and see if you can integrate it into the study or a study of your head construction. So like let's say we're going to do one where we we tilt our head up or a skull up. We don't have to do the neck and all, all of that for this one but let's just see if we can incorporate as a understructure as a way to kind of be generous to our study of, of this complex form which is the skull. And we use our, our setup steps, so our gesture steps to get you know the shape of the skull, we think about using that brow as the area for which we'll, we'll tilt our perspectives up or down. And then from here, let's start to you know, think about the interior parts. Like, and even at the beginning, you could use this as a tool to you know, think about some of the differences in terms of how you approach the drawing. Like I began here with a ball, but the skull isn't a ball. So instead, maybe I start to think about at an early stage, the idea that, well, there's there's a, a forehead that looks more like this. And instead of the ball, I'm gonna try to create maybe more of an egg. Now the ball is a great way to, to summarize the shape and get it down on the page and working. But if I really strip it back and start to look at just the skull, I think I would see something more like this, or I do see something more like this. The key to doing an exercise or building an awareness of the skull, I would say is, Treating it as still simplified forms or manageable forms, not getting lost in the nooks and crannies and the details and the cracking, but still try to work down the face in an organized way that just brings or allows for a little bit more attention to the way that you would normally think the construction. I think the purpose is that you want the skull to inform your head construction. You don't always want to have to draw an entire skull every time that you want to make a face. You want to take from this language or from this form and digest that information back into your process. So let's do our center line here. That gives me my symmetry. Let's just do our basic proportions. So half between the brow and the chin is the nose. Half between the nose and the brow is the sockets, bottom. Half again might be the keystone, center of the eye. Maybe we could do some thirds down here for the chin. Uh, first third is the separation of the teeth. Second third is the top of the chin and then that would be the bottom of the chin. In my head construction, I always look for the side plane. So that would come as a result of finding that temple, finding the hairline, and maybe I could see that a little bit better in terms of the skull, where that, where does that break? Right, so I've seen this plane, and then that, that has that change here to go up. So what might have been abstract in the head construction, and now with a, a little bit of study, you can get a, a bit more of a concrete feel for what it is that you're simplifying when you go through these steps. Here's that change. So I can really see from the top of the skull with that hairline drawn back or related back that there is this flatter surface. And that does pretty much end right behind that temple. So now that could be my uh, cutting back some of this egg form that I've started with. Here's this extra kind of interesting detail at the bottom that, that some head constructions like, don't always exaggerate or call attention to. Mine doesn't always. This is that mastoid process. I kind of like to design it like a little upside down shark fin. That would be where the sternomastoid would connect or find its home there, your neck muscle. And then what also interests me is right above this, I could see the auditory area. So sometimes in my head constructions, I lay in a little eight, a little figure eight or a couple spheres to show the placement of the ear and the, the placement of the jaw. So that's just kind of thinking about those two forms looking at their proximity or, or how, I, how I see them relative to that, that back point of the skull. Let's do our jaw shape. Now I'm seeing this would be that back portion to my jaw. The nice part is I, I have all of this as an envelope to try to, you know, so I'm not just working line to line or part to part in terms of my investigation of this form. But I do like to get these big parts set up around the outside. So here's the, the chin or the chains for the chin. And now I'd probably see a little bit underneath that. Now let's jump back up here and kind of work through our, our cheekbone. So the normal way I might approach this in terms of just trying to appreciate it would be resting a pair of glasses. And so my glasses aim for this line of the, the bottom of the socket. Then I'll drop that down and decide on a height and then bring this back. 
Sometimes you could think of this, or sometimes I'll think of this as resting on top of the figure eight there, that sideways eight, I guess. So now, but maybe I feel like, well, I, I always am so abstract with that. Like, how do I really interpret what this bone is? Well, it seems to have, there's more of a sweep. So I'm always an advocate for the idea that curves are best built from a series of straights. So if I can get a couple straight lines that help me get the big feel for that direction and that bone, then I could come back in and kind of add that nice S curve, right, that ends that bone towards the back. Maybe that helps me study and think about that, and then maybe I'll, I'll try to think more about the depth. Like, what is the perspective? Does this have a thickness to it? But the approach is always, what is the pattern or the big shape? Do I modify it to have a bit more of a curve? And then I like to think about what is the perspective. And then once I feel like I have some kind of understanding, then I start to develop the, the surface form, the perspective form. The transition of this into the temple is a really crazy and unique area. Right, so I'm thinking about the temple. Maybe we'll just do it again. Let's start as a straight. That could be the, the placement of the temple. Right? It's just the problem with the skull is it's so seductive to just start to find yourself in all of these little curves and these small crevices and these really beautiful winding bones. What does this uh, temple do? Well, that now it starts to kind of bend into the top of the forehead. So I'm just going to curve it right into this, this area of the brow line. And then let's also pick up, let's finish off what we started just in this investigation of the cheekbone. So the cheek kind of has this great curve forward. I usually leave this out in my head constructions because what I like to set up around this area is the, the idea that this is a side and that this is a front, right? So to have a curve that kind of extends past there breaks my box or breaks my basic front plane, side plane, or the way that I would appreciate that in a, a big head construction. So normally I would think of that same design there as like, here's that glasses, this is the frame, this is the lens, and that has that really abrupt turn. So you could see or appreciate now how reductive that is, right? Because this is way more organic, but I could also now start to and maybe add that, right? So think about that glasses shape turning in. It's of course, it's more curved, but here I'm just gonna bring it across. I always continue to kind of be fascinated by the idea that the bottom of the socket is really comes from your cheek. It's just bizarre. So now we're across the brow. Let's set up some more, just some areas here of like big ideas. Now you can see how, how easily I got pulled into really working through the small issues of that cheekbone and forgetting my own rule. I also see in the skull there's this uh, superciliary arch, which feels like it's a little cashew kind of bent and plugged into the side of that. Keystone, that's a weird little bump. So we'll design that and maybe even think about that architecture, that surface. Here's that glabella. So that would maybe pull back here. And then let's look at the socket. So socket is kind of rounded and then straighter on this area of the temple. But then we also get this spiraling. So I could feel like that, that plane where I would want to connect my eye, corner of my eye is in here, but I can also see with the use of cast shadow how deep and how much that recesses back in. So in my head construction or in the course, I talk about the, the eye living inside of kind of a, a cone, right? That's the eye socket as it pulls back, right? So we're thinking about all of that surface back in there that the eye would cover. My other way of interpreting this would be thinking of the, the sockets across the face as three planes. And does that seem to match? Sometimes the investigation of skull could be just you testing your preconceived ideas of, of what what and how you draw it. I go through periods where I draw the skull a lot and then when I don't. And sometimes when I don't, I regret that I don't more often. So on this side, I'm gonna drop that side of the socket down. And then I think at this side, it's always hard, this side. So what I think is especially difficult maybe in this view is like, how does that cheekbone show up over here? Like how would I draw what's happening on this side over here on that side? Maybe I'll just do more of a copy and really just try to study, not make this something it doesn't have to be. Maybe that's enough for this, just to get the idea that that's moving behind and then this drops down. Let's pick up with the nasal saddle. This would be a way for me to maybe test if I'm always putting this at the right height. So here's the attachment into that keystone. Here's the spine as it starts to move down. Here's the peak and then how the, the housing of that nasal aperture drops. 
Now, what am I, what is the shape of that? Kind of like an upside down heart. And then here it peaks up, you get the shape and then curious about how would I explore like a simple way to show the space inside of this? How would I extend that spine back or maybe show this part? And so that becomes that housing. And what about these planes? So this seems to drop down in this way. And then we really get a, a strong influence from the cheek still. One thing I see with the cheek or kind of notice is this square that I've been referring to as the glasses. If I cut that at a diagonal from corner to corner, maybe that'd be a way to kind of keep this curve, but also show that the cheekbone itself here starts to recess a bit. So that pulls back and maybe I could design that over here. That might be a nice takeaway that I could I could split that square into a diagonal at some point. And that might be a nice, a nice way to make my head construction feel a little bit more reflective of the, the skull itself. Another thing I notice is maybe in the, about in the middle of that square, that's where it looks like this cheek curves and becomes the canine. That's a useful observation, maybe from the standpoint of rhythm. Maybe I could pull that down to the, maybe that's where the plane of the, the teeth change. And maybe I could use that over here too. So you can see how it's half analytical and then half, you're like kind of testing theories almost. Well, I think I might be able to do this or learn this. It's just in opposition to like, here's the mouth, here's the tooth, right? So you can see how the whole energy changes instead of maybe some kind of intellectual discovery and investigation, you're now shifted and maybe your thinking becomes more passive the emphasis is put more on just the direct translation of what you see into you know, your paper. So teeth are always weird. How do we know how much to add or how little, right? Where maybe we could, we could just design some shapes but not draw all of them. So we'd have our incisors and then the, the canine, but maybe instead I'll just kind of map the way they turn instead of drawing them all. And then what I think is really interesting is how they change direction. And so I'm really, able to now think about the structure of the bite. And the bite's coming from up here. That's pretty wild. So I'll just take this curve and maybe move it back. And then this could be a way where I would think about the back of our bite. So molars and premolars would be back here. Let's just hatch that in because I don't think I'd ever use this. Maybe if the, the mouth was open or there's somebody biting or yelling or something like that. <laughs> Let's just judge or think about the height of the teeth. That's pretty interesting. How tall are they? And then let's get the, the back of the jaw. So how close is the back of the jaw to the teeth? It's pretty close. I'm going to try to draw it as like a thin box. Right, so that starts to curve in. So I want to think of this as having a depth and a width or a cross. And then it's got a little gap in the middle. That's pretty cool. So this point, so that push of the bone up or that from my view would be going slightly behind or under the cheekbone. That would be grabbing or it would be grabbed by the temporalis muscle. So you'd have your, your big, the big muscle on the side of your head comes down and grabs that point. You can see this much larger in different animal skulls. So that'd be a nice thing to do next even is maybe grab an animal skull. Not that they're readily available like at the supermarket, but you can find pictures online and, and see if you could treat it the same way and then start comparing these. What's the difference between, you know, like the shape of the cheek and a human and the cheek shape and, you know, a lion or a gorilla. And then how would I draw the lower portion of the mouth? Well, I, I, all I mostly did here was just adjust my center line. So I want to get the idea that the mouth comes out and back. But one thing I notice is the lower teeth are a little smaller. That makes sense because we have to be able to close our, our mouths. Right? So not that that's going to really impact much. I'm not going to, I'm not going to draw all the teeth. But for me, it's enough just to kind of see across and develop that form. I like that idea where we found that kind of cut moment or that plane change moment. Maybe this can go back and up that way. And I think it's interesting that the, the teeth on the bottom come from your jaw. I think I'm just teeth averse. I hate the dentist. I hate going to the dentist. I don't, I don't particularly like teeth. Let's see what the damage is, shall we? And then we have the mandible that would be a little bit more of a, I don't know, like a really mild box but this would all be a bone, right? So this is interesting that the teeth kind of sit into and on top of that form. 
Here's that point I was communicating in the course about the difference between male and female being wider or different angled. Now on this side, how would I show that same jaw over here? So I'm always asking questions when I'm drawing. Sometimes those questions are productive, sometimes they're critical, sometimes they're any number of things. The thing for the skull would be just anything to avoid getting lost in just an, an act of copying. So maybe that's our denture sphere. I think my jaw's a little beefy. So now I'm noticing that this guy's a little, got a little beefy jaw. So let's bring that up some, let's bring that chin. I think the, the form of the chin's pretty interesting. It's smoother than I kind of remember drawing. It's kind of a nice flow from the bottom of the mouth into the, kind of the curve and turn of this chin back. And so let's move this up. You know, it's not supposed to be precious. I'm just trying to make a study so that I can take something away and, and be better the next time or test theories or ideas that I have about the head construction and see how I might be able to, to broaden or to advance them. But that's about where I'd end it, right? I don't think that there's much worth kind of going into anything further unless, you know, you could see how it quickly will devolve at this point for me into hatching, which is fine, but it's just another way of exploring surface and form. So hopefully that helps, but so go grab a Proko skull and have fun trying to abstract your head construction and pick up on the big features of the skull as you draw. This course will help with any number of things. It could be invention, building more of a backbone and a scaffolding to the way that you think about your light and shadow. You're going to be learning a step-by-step -step approach that will take you through how to understand the proportions of the face and then address the features as sculptures that will be set on top of those primary forms. Check it out. It's at proco.com slash Hampton. I'll see you there.